private equity acquisition model. Let's look at the components of this financial model. It has everything in a typical three statement model, including major assumptions and drivers and the three statements, everything in a traditional discounted cash flow model, and then it contains additional assumptions for various operating scenarios. It also has built in sensitivity analysis to see the impact that changes in drivers have on changes in outputs. And finally, it has IRR and return analysis breakdowns. Let's discuss the purpose of this model. It's used to evaluate the attractiveness of an acquisition. It may be used by a private equity firm, corporate development team, a private investor, or anyone who's looking at buying a business. It has a reasonably detailed operating model, so this level is adding a bit more complexity over and above our basic DCF models that we've looked at so far. This model allows you to compare different deal structures and acquisition assumptions to see the impact of those. The relevant courses for learning how to build this model from scratch include business valuation, M&A modeling, and LBO modeling. Let's jump into the model and look at some more detail. Here we are inside the acquisition model. We have our cover page as usual and can click through on the table of contents to the main model. In the main model, we have all the sections that drive it, such as the assumptions, then the three financial statements, supporting schedules, the valuation and return section, and sensitivity analysis. Let's open it all up and see how it works. This model has a few more assumptions than some of the other basic DCF models we've looked at. For example, Gross margin has several line items that feed into it. The SG&A line item consists of quite a few items. Then there are the balance sheet drivers, a few more than we've seen in the past. And then we get to the income statement. This income statement, again, has quite a bit more detail. Cost of goods sold has a major workup to it, and so does SG&A. We've got the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, schedules, and then the valuation and return section. This is where we have the assumptions that drive the transaction. And you'll notice here that it's got a vendor note. So because this is designed to be used by a private equity firm, it's common when buying a private company to ask the seller if they will accept a take back note, which essentially means they don't get paid 100% of the purchase price on close. So in this example, they get paid 45% of the purchase price on close, 25% a couple of years later, and the remaining 30% a year after that. So you can see that the purchase price, PP here, is broken down over time. We've also got an EBITDA normalization section where we can feed in here what would have a detailed schedule behind it, a detailed schedule including all of the adjustments that are made to this private company. We get down here to the valuation timing where we have the date of the acquisition. There's a stub period in this case, and then the forecast period and terminal value. In terms of calculating return analysis, we calculate the net present value using a hurdle rate of 20%. And then we also layer on a miniature LBO. And this is a miniature simplified LBO where there's only one tranche of debt and it's two times cash flow as the maximum amount instead of some of the higher values you might see with more traditional LBOs. But because this is a small private company, it's probably a reasonable assumption. And then down below, we actually calculate the levered free cash flow. And you can see that there's the purchase price of the company, which is the cash on close. Then there is the vendor take back note, which gets paid in years two and three. And then there's the deleveraging, which is the, which is the repayment of the LBO debt. And then finally, you get the levered free cash flow. That levered free cash flow drives the internal rate of return. So you can see it's these levered free cash flows and the dates are up here. These are the dates of those cash flows. You get the cash on cash multiple 4.7 times. And then below that, we have sensitivity analysis. So this is the structure and setup of this more detailed acquisition model that can be used for illustrating the rate of return from buying a company outright. 
Let's look at playing around with some scenarios in this acquisition model. You can see how we've placed at the top here both the unlevered internal rate of return and the levered internal rate of return. This is very helpful because then we can see how changes in assumptions impact these two different rates of return. So the first thing we want to look at here is the purchase price. The purchase price is equal to 5 times EBITDA. If we're able to acquire the business for less, say 4 times, that obviously increases the rates of return. Same thing if we make it a much higher purchase price, the rates of return go down. Let's put it back to 5. Then when we go to calculate the terminal value, to the extent that we make the exit multiple higher, that also increases the internal rate of return, naturally, because we're saying that you buy the business for five times, you sell it for seven times, well, there's a spread there being made on the multiple it was bought for and the multiple it was sold for. So we can see how those drive the model. Now let's look at how leverage drives the model. There is a vendor take back note here, and it's quite significant. If we were to get rid of the vendor take back note, Let's see what happens to these internal rates of return. To do that, you simply put 100% of the purchase price on close and zero in the remaining, the remaining years. So it's all on close. Look at what happened here. The levered rate of return is much closer now to the unlevered rate of return. Why is it not the same? Well, because there's still some other debt. We have this miniature LBO down here. And this is still providing leverage and thus a higher rate of return on a levered basis. But if we want to get rid of this, we can just say that the max multiple of cash flow that we're going to run through the model here is zero times. And if we put it to zero times, all of a sudden there's no LBO that flows through. And the levered rate of return is exactly equal to the unlevered rate of return because there's no leverage anywhere in the model. So that is a very quick overview for you of how this model works, how leverage impacts internal rate of return, and how the assumptions about the purchase price and the terminal value also impact the rate of return for this model.